Okay. We're about to initiate the afternoon session. This is a common session. And uh, we have the great honor and pleasure of having here Professor William Clark. Professor Clark is the Harvey Brook Professor of International Science, Public Policy and Human Development at Harvard University. Uh, he works at the John Kennedy School of Government and he is currently co-directing the program on sustainability science at that school. We are extremely pleased to have here Professor Clark because we are uh, for several years now trying to promote the field of sustainability science here at the University of Fergen. We have done that with mixed results which is not uh, the right time to comment on that, but we keep trying because we do think that the work on sustainability science is a new way of addressing science and most importantly addressing global challenges and most important global challenges our current society is facing. So uh, we are extremely pleased here, William, to have you because you are one of the most uh, silent and leading voices in this field. So we all hope that we will learn a lot having you here. And please, the floor is all yours. Thank you. You will have 90 minutes. You will administer them as you please. Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> You've had too much lunch. <laughs> Okay, so especially you in the back, there will be a quiz afterwards. Um, okay, so what your leadership asked me to do was uh, take a uh, high-level survey of how uh, many, not all of us, who have been uh, coming into the field of sustainable development, uh, an agenda I'll talk about, from the side of the sciences, some of us natural science, some of us social science, uh, how we have begun over the last 10 or 15 years to shape this from simply trying to do one's best in a messy situation to actually beginning to have some structure to what is in this field, what kind of conceptual frameworks it has, and crucially, what kind of actual scientific advances uh, have built up over the last uh, decade or so. So uh, I'm going to try to provide that, but in doing it, you're going to have to do most of the work. Um, uh, trying to do a survey this broad means that I'll be talking a lot about generalities. And uh, if you are tired or lazy, just let the generalities go by and nothing much will happen. Uh, if you want to do something with this stuff, what I urge you to do right now is take a problem that's really important to you about how human activities, the environment, poverty, security interact with one another. That can be climate change. It can be improving uh, agricultural productivity in a really poor part of the world. It can be improving uh, public health in the face of, of uh, changing emergent diseases. But take a real problem you know well and as I move across in these concept areas, uh, try to say what would that framework, what would that lens that I'm putting up mean for your problem? Uh, and in parts, you know, for many of you, the answer to many of these ideas will be not much. I don't see why that's useful at all. Um, for others, I hope that what you'll come out with is some insights, notions saying, well, maybe that's not the way I always looked at it, but looking at it this way can get me one step further ahead. And what I hope then in the question period is that you'll be able to come back with reference to the particular cases you've been thinking about and say, well, that idea you put forward about uh, resilience or complexity or whatever it was, I try to apply that to my own case and I'm left with this mystery. How should we think about that? Okay? so. Think hard about a case that matters to you and try to make a dialogue going in your own head between uh, me and what that would be. That's what we would do if this were a you know, three-person seminar rather than a, a scattered classroom right after lunch. Um, okay, 
So I'm going to do this in terms of six big questions. Uh, these are not the only questions that people working in sustainability science worry about, but it's six of the biggest ones on which I think we actually know more than we did a decade ago. So there are actually some results and answers to go along with the questions. Um, and I'll do um, some slides on each of these and then come back and summarize uh, in one line what, what I think some tentative answers are to each of them at the end. I think. All right, so first, what's the problem of sustainable development? Um, the field has been accused of sustainable development is like the Anglo-American notion of Humpty Dumpty. It's a word that means whatever you want it to mean. Um, I would argue that that is no more true than saying that about ideas like justice or democracy. Yes, different people have different interpretations. It depends on your history and your context and so on. But um, there's been a substantial amount of work internationally in the policy community and in the science community of trying to uh, bring down some workable definitions that make the term a useful one. Uh, where I want to start with that, uh, though you could go much earlier, you could go into arguments about sustainable fisheries management or sustainable agriculture, which go back as far as the history of those fields. But as an international idea, the concept of sustainable development dates back to the mid-1980s, when as it, it actually came out of the third great multilateral set of conventions and discussions happening at the time. Uh, these were the so-called Brandt Commissions and Palma Commissions that had looked respectively at what the world could do to attack the issues of global poverty and what the world could do to attack the issues of global armaments and insecurity. And what they came out of those first two big multilateral discussions with the recognition that efforts to improve poverty alleviation or to advance national security would be highly limited unless people began bringing environment into the conversation. Uh, so they set up a third great multilateral commission, this uh, run by, uh, by uh, Grow Harlan Brundtland, uh, well known in this part of the world. Uh, it's a former prime minister, um, uh, also graduate of Harvard School of Public Health, I will be clear, um, who uh, ran her uh, so-called World Commission on Environment and Development and came out with the conclusion that I've quoted here. Uh, environment is where we live. Uh, development is what we all do in attempting to approve our lot, our lives within that abode. The two are inseparable. And the commission, which consisted of no scientists but leading members of government, business, and civil society from all around the world, concluded somewhat optimistically that humanity has the ability to make development sustainable that is to advance human well-being and poverty alleviation within the limits or constraints of trying to keep the environment livable. Okay, the question then, the central challenge of sustainability as a political agenda and as a science agenda is what do you mean by the ability? Uh, how would that ability actually turn into practice? Um, so the development part has been pretty clear. That is, we do have the ability to make development work. Um, consider something that, that uh, recent Nobel laureate Angus Deaton has called the great escape. That is the fact that humanity for most of its multiple thousands of years of existence on the planet uh, has lived lives of somewhere between 30 and 45 years uh, average life expectancy at birth um, for millennia. Um, didn't matter whether you were in Renaissance Europe or in, uh, in uh, Damascus back in the years before Christ, uh, in Africa or in uh, North America, uh, that was your expectation. The great escape from that apparently eternal history that the lot of humans was to live 35 to 45 years uh, came beginning in the only the late 1800s when uh, first in uh, Europe and North America, and then quickly thereafter in the rest of the world, suddenly we have this unprecedented uh, escape from the bounds of early death as life expectancy at birth starts going up towards uh, a, a median around 80 years now. Um, and if you think in terms of whatever idea you might have of what constitutes human well-being and the good life, doubling the number of years 
that the average person has to spend on this planet is a pretty good start of things. Now, if those lives were miserable the way Malthus predicted they would be, uh, that would be less encouraging. But in fact, we're not only living longer, we're living better. Uh, these curves show the, uh, the total number of people not living in poverty, uh, the number not living in extreme poverty, which you know, the total numbers were going up uh, through around 1970, but in fact in both absolute and proportional numbers uh, have been going down since. That does not mean that there isn't a lot billion people or more in acute poverty today, but it does say that those trend lines are going in the right direction. You could say we have exercised our ability to make development, meaning human development and poverty alleviation, work, and it's a matter of being able to continue that into the future. The problem is, of course, that making development sustainable means not buying all of that improvement in human well-being at an unsustainable cost in terms of the natural environment, what Brundtland called the home in which we all live. And there, the, con you know, the curves are also going up, but they're the wrong curves. Uh, so uh, that same period has uh, seen what many will call the, great, the sixth great extinction episode uh, in the history of planet Earth, a radically, rapidly increasing number of extinctions of various forms of animals. Um, the uh, the uh, photograph there is a picture from my own country of what has happened to the in soil erosion uh, just over a period of 20 years during the 1930s our great dust bowl uh, from the grass elevation you see at the top of the figure all that dirt across hundreds of thousands of hectares in the middle of North America simply disappeared that natural resource never to be seen again until you know, the oceans collapse and we get it back from the Gulf of Mexico, where all that soil now lives. Um, the great extinction been matched by the great poisoning. This is a curve of, of uh, the concentration of mercury, a deadly neurotoxin uh, that you find in the uh, tissues of Arctic wildlife. Uh, seals, whales, uh, uh, penguins, so forth and so on. Um, uh, that has been going rapidly up. The argument is that the last polar bear will not, in fact, die because there are no more icebergs. It will die because of dementia. Uh, that is because the levels of mercury in its bloodstream are so substantial that the polar bear simply doesn't know how to do anything anymore. Now, that isn't just about polar bears. Um, if this were a lecture hall in my own university on the east coast of North America, uh, a third of you in the room who are women would have in your bloodstream today concentrations of mercury high enough that any child you might ever have would suffer cognitive uh, damage. That is, they would not be as smart as they would be if we had not been spewing mercury, mostly through fossil fuel development, uh, into the atmosphere for all of your lives. Now, for those of you in this classroom, it's not quite as bad. Mine is bad because we're on the east coast of North America. We eat lots of shellfish. No one in Scandinavia does that, right? Um, but they don't feed you shellfish in a summer school. Um, uh, and relatively high income populations. So it's been high income people eating lots of shellfish and uh, high predator ocean fish that lead to these high levels, but for most of you in this room, uh, your levels of mercury poisoning are to the extent that uh, uh, it would be a chance of better than one in 10 that your kids won't be as smart as they could be uh, because of the mercury you're carrying. That is horrible. We should be in the streets protesting it and we barely know it. Of course, what we do all know about is that going along with the great extinction and the great poisoning has been the great warming, acidifying, drowning event of global climate change um, and so forth. So um, we've been messing things up. Now, that's not a one directional case. There have been improvements. Uh, we've seen Im huge improvements in the efficiency of many devices, electronic automobiles, uh, 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 high-tech LED lights, uh, uh, more efficient cook stoves, so forth and so on. Um, we've made progress in learning how to manage forest resources sustainably through community forestry efforts. 
Um, we have, uh, in case of global issues, this is a curve of stratospheric ozone after a really uh, enormously dangerous period of rapid depletion of ozone through the release of, of chlorofluorocarbons and other industrial chemicals. Uh, that is a case where we did get the science harnessed, did actually manage to put together an international treaty, and as a result, the ozone shield is repairing itself uh, at least inhibiting um, the likelihood that we will all have our genetic composition fried by ultraviolet radiation. Um, so progress is possible, but it's progress on the parts. Um, the challenge remains to go beyond the individual parts. You invent a more efficient light bulb, I invent a more efficient, uh, a more effective way of handling community forestry so that we all share alike. Um, uh, you negotiate an international treaty on mercury to get at whole sectors, that is to actually transform the way we use the planet to, to convert it into human well-being in ways that are sustainable. So uh, that is true in the energy sector where uh, over your lifetimes uh, the demands will go up by 40% or more uh, with different ways of having the world look as we uh, secure those needs happen in the agricultural sector where demand will go up 50% or more. And again, we have uh, damaging ways of doing it and we have uh, more sustainable and effective ways of doing it. Um, it will happen in human habitation where the amount of installed urban structures uh, will go up by 60% or more. Uh, we will build more urban structure in your lifetimes than we have built in all of human history to date. And the question, therefore, even as we worry about uh, in wonderful cities like Bergen, how you do restorations or preservations of this neighborhood or that, the point is that the real action is we're doubling the amount of built infrastructure in your lifetimes, and will we double it in ways that lead to a world more like, I think that is Vancouver, Canada, uh, the, the Canadian version of Bergen. Uh, or the bottom figure, which you can guess which city it is, unfortunately, it could represent more than 40 of them around the world today. Those are choices we face, and the question is, do we have the ability to not just choose intellectually, but bring into action in the real world uh, one of those scenarios rather than the other, above the level of individual improvements in this law or that technology to shift whole sectors of human activity. Uh, worse, the sectors interact with one another. So what uh, John Beddington, the former uh, 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 science advisor to the UK government, has called um, the perfect storm of colliding needs for water that we need for human consumption, for agriculture, and for energy. Food that is uh, in contest with uh, environmental conservation issues and energy issues and so on and so on. These things are all interconnected and so the problem, the challenge before us is what do we do about managing not even the trivial problem of changing the world's energy production sector or agricultural production sector, but looking at the interactions among those. So that's the challenge between it. The problem of sustainable development is to move beyond incremental improvements in the part, as important as those are. Those are our building blocks, but we have to build something with them. To build capacity for systems level transformation in how we serve our needs for energy, how we serve our needs for food and habitation and the connections among them. So I would say that and alleviating poverty in the process is what the central challenge we're trying to do in sustainable development is, the question becomes what contribution does science have to make to that agenda? So what should be the actual goal of efforts to approach the problem? Now that may seem straightforward, like it's solve all those problems, uh, but solve them how? What are we actually trying to accomplish with these systems transformations? Um, in one sense, one could argue that, well, the international community has solved that issue. They've defined 17 sustainable development goals uh, just a year and a bit ago in, in, uh, uh, in the UN. Uh, and that's a good thing. Um, these are now um, the, the consolidated, politically negotiated goals that the world has agreed on we have to achieve. The problem, of course, is that 
the science of goals, there actually is one, has shown us that if we want goals to serve the function of bringing us together in joint endeavors, um, we need to make distinctions between special interests and shared interests. And this is true whether it's in negotiating labor agreements or uh, city decisions as to how to do zoning arrangements or a global climate treaty. Um, that everyone is entitled, obviously, to their own goals in a democratic society, but shared goals are needed when people disagree but need to find common ground to live together. Uh, that sounds like common sense. It's also backed by a huge amount of scholarship, again, ranging from labor negotiations through international treaties. And the important thing is, therefore, to step back from our individual claims. You may be a biodiversity person. You may be a poverty alleviation person. You may be a public health person and say, those are all great, but how do they connect together? Where do we have a common framework, a common set of goals, so that we're not all just competing for the same resources, the same water, the same energy, the same political clout. And that, if you will, is the problem that the UN process in its horse trading for sustainability did not solve. They came out with 17 special interests and no particular notion of what do we share across the middle of that. Um, they also totally confused the issue of means and ends. Um, a, a reasonable argument says your ultimate goals, your shared interests should be about what you're trying to accomplish, leaving it as an open question amenable to experimentation and science as to what's the best means to accomplish it. But if you're a connoisseur of the UN goals, they put poverty alleviation and building partnerships on the same level. Now, what could be more nuts? Um, somebody really say, well, I get a trade-off. I'll take I'll lose two units of poverty alleviation because I want two more units of partnership building. Uh, this is nuts. Uh, partnership building is a means to achieve stuff uh, like poverty alleviation or fixing the global climate problem or whatever. And again, in the political negotiations of the UN SDGs, those distinctions were over and over again not made. Nothing in that list of 17 goals in that famous table is a bad thing to do but they don't solve the problem of what are we all in this together on. Special interests versus shared, ends versus means, just look across the group and they fail that test. That again, I say, is not just my preference, it is what a good body of scholarship on what do we do when we each want something different but know we have to cooperate to achieve certain core issues. So, um, if we then stand back and say, well, the UN, is a step, the UN SDGs are a step forward, but what do we do beyond that? It turns out there have been two big contenders for the answer to the question, what should be the goals of human development? And one of them is poverty alleviation and a good life for our kids. Uh, and one of them is environmental conservation. And since the idea was formed, people each of whom would acknowledge some legitimacy of the other viewpoint, have still been arguing hard that their central concern is one, or the, one of those or the other. But when we then apply this template of which is a special interest versus what is the most broadly shared interest you can get, that is, could get more people working together to the common end, which is a means versus which is an end, there, I think, the argument has now pretty well come out. And you go back to the Brooklyn Commission itself, I think they pretty much had it right. The goal of sustainable development, they argued, is to ensure that development need, meets the needs of people today without compromising the ability of future generations of people to meet their own needs. Their concern was clearly that environment was a means to the end of improving the human condition, alleviating poverty. You had to pay vastly more attention to environment than we were, but for the UN negotiations back in 1987, the answer was it's human well-being, poverty alleviation, the good life for people, but for heaven's sake, pay more attention to the environment in doing it. So I think where the debate has come out today among people who are trying to build some structure into this is that sustainable development is defined in terms of not just the human needs of the Brundtland Commission in 1987, uh, but a broader concept of human well-being, that is, the good life, uh, however, you may however we may variously define it. 
a good life in terms of meeting material needs, but also desires for health and education, for society, for, for physical security, um, for biophilia. I mean, it may well be that an important part of my notion of my own well-being is knowing that there are whales that certain countries haven't hunted to extinction yet, uh, or redwood trees uh, in my own country that certain administrations of the government have not chopped down yet, or all sorts of other nice things about environment that I look about not as an instrument of improving my well-being, but as a component of my definition of what it is to have a good life, knowing these things are out there. Um, so, okay, if, if, if at least one defensible notion of the goal of sustainability is improved human well-being, that leaves us with the questions about distribution. Who's well-being? Uh, what do we do about thinking about terms of justice and equity? And my argument would be it's become pretty clear even if you come into this as a climate scientist or a biodiversity advocate, we have to think about those distributional issues. We have to think about issues of justice and equity. And there have been two big dimensions for that. One is intragenerational equity, which in the figure we see here of, 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 of rising rich uh, uh, tower developments in uh, rapidly urbanizing areas of the world, sitting right next to some of the poorest uh, most dismal shanty towns imaginable. Uh, that is not an equitable situation. Uh, but we also see it across intergenerationally as to how much of my well being here is being purchased or created at the expense of my children's well being because I've used up all the resources or I've dumped too much garbage into the atmosphere so that they're going to suffer whether for mercury poisoning or climate change or just despoilation of, of there being no forest left. How much of my well-being here in those big high-rise towers is bought at the cost of throwing my garbage over the fence into the slum next door, uh, sending my waste products away to be boiled down and have their copper and cadmium recovered uh, in very unhealthy ways by people doing waste reprocessing. Uh, so well-being, but well-being at whose expense? And the argument of sustainability from its beginning has been one in which social justice matters. And the argument has been, we've got to figure out ways of improving your and my well-being here and now, but not via the means of damaging my neighbor's well-being by throwing garbage on him or her, or my future generation's well-being by throwing my waste products or stealing the resources that they would need to grow up. And so the term that has emerged that has huge implications as we do optimization programs and so on is human well-being conceived of inclusively across all people here and there, now and in the future. And as we do the thought experiment of, say, is a world built around fossil fuel energy or renewable energy more likely to bend the curve towards sustainable development? What we're actually saying there is it will bend the curve in directions that let you continue to improve your well-being by having adequate energy needs or getting adequate energy needs, but not at the cost of you using them all up today so he doesn't get any of them or you using up the environment now with fossil fuels so that by the time we come to the future, we'll have to do draconian constraints on the amount of energy available to anybody. Okay. So that is the notion of inclusive well-being and the thought experiment you would want to do would be count up the well-being of all people now, rich countries and poor countries, all people in future generations and compare them under those two scenarios. Now, obviously, that's a thought experiment, not an actual computation, but it is worth thinking of as we argue, should we do high density zoning or widely spread out zoning? Should we think about renewable energy versus fossil fuel energy? Should we think about high intensity monoculture agriculture or diverse cropping agriculture? What in principle would that do to this notion of inclusive well-being across and between generations? Okay. Um, so. Uh, so we include the answer to that question, what should be the goal with this notion of development pathways for which inclusive well-being does not decline. That means it's hopefully improving now, but not improving at a cost of future generations having it go down. 
And I include that last line because, make it clear, that is nothing like the system we have today. Business as usual is, if anything, more and more inequitable. More and more the well-being of a very few is being purchased or taken or stolen at the cost of other people on the planet who are remaining at levels of poverty or just out of poverty or being subject to waste disposal dumped in their backyards and so on, and well-being that we are building up now for the few at the expense of radically diminished possibilities of the future. So that sustainability from the moment you define its goals becomes a politically radical agenda in which redistribution of the opportunities to advance development uh, is essential. Redistribution from saying a privileged position of a few today uh, at the cost of the many today and elsewhere towards a more equitable division. Uh, and that has implications running through all the rest of my talk because it says as much as we're going to turn to science and engineering and medicine and health to help this agenda along, the agenda is at its core an, an extraordinarily political agenda that would be radically changing who benefits from the way we conduct our society. And I see no escape from that. I, I see the, the notion that you can pursue a sustainability science, uh, disengage from politics, because you, you sort of feel uncomfortable with it and you think science should just be objective, uh, doesn't work uh, any more than, say, pursuing public health uh, could be done as a, uh, as a disinterested objective in it doesn't matter whose health I try to improve. OK, third question. What do we need to sustain if we're to achieve this goal of at least non-decreasing inclusive well-being over the long run across places of the world? What is it you need to sustain? So pause. Think of the problem I asked you to think about that you care a lot about. Figure you're only going to get to measure one thing. And it's not well-being as such, because we have no idea how we would measure or even define the well-being of people 10 generations hence. Think, what is it that you're going to manage this community, this country, this region of yours to sustain? What are you going to make sure there is as much of to hand on to the next generation, as much of to share with the people next door, because that's going to be your guidance to whether I'm moving this thing sustainably or not. And obviously, for the case of a fossil fuel versus renewables energy agenda, it says, OK, I sort of get it. What I want to do is sustain, say, the capacity of the atmosphere to function without being totally screwed up, uh, which means putting less greenhouse gases into it. So I somehow want to sustain a, uh, uh, an atmosphere which is not so overloaded with greenhouse gases as to cause catastrophic climate change, or so overloaded with mercury emissions as to make my children into idiots. Okay. What is that for your specific case? Get that in your head, uh, or at least get some options in your head, and then let's carry on. This is a 15-second option you have to write down. What are you going to sustain for the case you care most about? Be much easier if I had a 15-second clock in front of me, but I don't. So let's move on. But I hope you've actually written that down. It will matter. Um, what do we need to sustain to achieve the goal? Well, I've struggled with this for a long time, but I finally got my image. Um, this, who knows what that is? Solar Impulse 2, the plane that just recently com completed its round the world tour uh, without ever power being powered by anything but sunlight. That's not quite true. They did not use sunlight to produce the food that fed the pilot. Uh, but all of the energy for the propellers and the navigation aids and so on came from sunlight. And so, in a sense, in the simplest possible notion, uh, what I ask you to do is think about uh, that airplane being the, you know, the development trajectory we're doing. And we're trying to get somewhere with it, somewhere we want to be. But we got to think pretty hard about like, not using up all the electricity in the batteries. Um, traditionally, we've evaluated development. We've said, what needs to be sustained? Well, gee, what is it? We talk about rates of GNP growth. Rates of population growth. What? China is in panic right now because its rates of population recruitment are not high enough to cover 
the uh, caring of the older generation, my generation, um, which uh, dutifully emerged in a one-child family world. So, but we talk about, ah, what I want to sustain is rates of GNP growth, rates of population growth. Uh, or what I want to sustain if I'm an enviro is I, I'm worried about deforestation rates in the Amazon. So what I want to do is pull those rates much lower, up to maybe zero. Uh, or I talk about greenhouse gas reduction rates. That's the whole argument around the Paris Agreement. What's the problem with that? What would be the rates that we would think about for Solar Impulse 2? Something like airspeed, right? So you imagine the pilot in the cockpit looking to keep airspeed going. If they worry about headwinds over here, they turn it a little bit over there. But they've got a destination. They want to get to a place, and they want to get to it reasonably quickly. So sure, he's following airspeed. If you get to watch one other thing and you're the pilot of that electricity-powered airplane, what's the thing you're going to watch? Daylight. Hmm? Daylight. Da Daylight. Daylight, but they fly at night, too. Exactly. Power. How much, how many amps are in your battery? Quite literally, that is the master gauge in the cockpit of that airplane. Because it says, of course I'm going to go through night. Um, daylight is my friend. Night is definitely not my friend. Clouds are not my friend. Bergen is not my friend. So uh, what I'm looking at is how many amps I've got in the battery, okay? how much charge, and is that charge enough Sure, it'll go up and down, but is it enough so I'm going to be back in daylight before that goes to zero? Because when it goes to zero, I go into the ocean. This is definitely a non-sustainable trajectory. So in fact, what the Solar Impulse 2 tells you is that the ultimate thing I need to sustain is the amps in the battery. And I get to charge it up during daylight, and I get to draw it down overnight. It's not that it has to stay constant, but that is the stock I'm looking at. It isn't a rate. If I can keep the amps sufficiently high, I may prefer a higher rate of speed than not. That would be fine. I may prefer this destination rather than that one, but if I find I only have enough amps to get to that destination, I better be changing my goal as well. And so the point is that going from solar impulse to more broadly for society, the, the, central, the first central scientific conclusion out of work on sustainability is that we need to start figuring out what our version of the amps in the battery is, but for society and the world as a whole. What are the fundamental asset stocks, stocks not flows, that we need to sustain in order not to go into the ocean. Keep in mind, that's not saying it has to stay constant. It can go down and up and down and up, but it has to stay above depletion levels or we go into the tank. Okay, uh, and in our version, that would mean it goes down so low that future generations do not have the set of assets. They, we do not hand them as many amps in the battery as we were handed uh, when we were given over the piloting of the airplane. And that's the problem. So the problem for us is, well, like, what assets do you mean? What is the social equivalent of, of amps in the battery for the planet we live on? Um, do it as an easier problem. Um, I almost turned that into one. I, I was down at the museum for the uh, Hanseatic League um, uh, yesterday, and there's some gorgeous old paintings of, of Norwegian boats going out, but this has certain characteristics I wanted. So what are the asset stocks? Think of this fisher person. They're trying to improve their own well-being and that of their family today, but in a way that they can hand on to their children at least as much amps in the battery, at least as much of a set of asset stocks as they started with. So um, let's think it through. Um, what's the most obvious asset this fisherman has? I hear, fear, I hear the boat. Uh, just because I happen to do one ordering, I think I'm starting with the boat. Yeah, I'm starting with the boat. So if you take away the boat, he's got problems, okay? Um, and conceivably, you would want to be able to hand on to your kids the boat or a better boat, right? So that's, and that is the, keep in mind, the boat is the only thing 
that our current way of doing economic accounts in the world today counts. We're going to come to the fish in the minute and a couple of other things. But the boat, how much it costs to buy it, how many boats a year we buy, that is the only thing tracked in our rates of GNP growth and so on, because we manufactured it and sold it on the marketplace. The fish, mm, do that. Uh, what about, um, you know, would any of you like to take this fisher person's place? How well would you do? What is it? So, do I have volunteers? I think he needs his skills and also his physical ability, his strengths. I did not pay her for this, but this is bang on. Of course, one needs to be healthy. If this person has tuberculosis or is malnourished, big trouble. But even put one of you who, I hope, do not have either tuberculosis or malnourishment in that boat, and we're still going to be in trouble because you have no idea how to row a boat or catch a fish. Not this kind of fish, anyway. Uh, and much less to row a boat in New England's open ocean waters. So, so we need what would be called here manufactured capital, but we also need human capital. The skills that, at a minimum, the fisher might want to hand down to his children, okay? and the health which is crucial to do the work. Um, someone named Fish. Yeah, if there are no fish in the sea, uh, then there is nothing to harvest. So if we over-harvest, um, that's another capital asset. So now we have the components of the, the, the amps in our battery consist of, of the boat, the manufactured capital, the human capital of skills and health, the natural capital of fish. And note, any one of those goes to zero, and this is not a sustainable trajectory. I don't know what it is, but it is a mess. What else do we need? What other assets matter to this fisherman's ability to hand on to his children and grandchildren at least as good a life as he's got here? The ocean is The ocean is How is the ocean involved? It's a natural habitat of the fish. <laughs> yeah, it's providing a whole set of nutrients and currents and habitats for spawning. So you could have the fish, but you poison the oceans, um, uh, you acidify the oceans as we're doing right now, You're gonna, you pollute the oceans with the same mercury we're worrying about in the fish, sorry. Uh, it was first in the water because that's where we put it out of the atmosphere. So we're worried about the oceans. I might fold that into natural capital. It's just we're thinking of one of them as the fish, and the rest is the rest of the geophysical environment. Um, what's off on the horizon there? That's another boat. So, yeah. I was going to suggest his experience in knowing what kinds of uh, places to actually look for catch, okay. as well as to avoid weather, okay. and perhaps even to avoid competition. Okay, so we've loaded here into his experience or human capital skills a bunch of really interesting other pieces. And what I was going to pull in with this boat on the horizon is with any luck, this fisher has had his own country negotiate some boundaries over which this, let's call it, international fishing concern off the horizon there, the, the boat with big masts. Are they allowed to come in and take all his fish with their bigger piece of equipment and so on? If the answer is, yeah, they can do that, we've got no international law against it, guess how long he's going to be able to pursue his well-being as opposed to the same fish, the same ocean, will continue to the well-being of, say, some Norwegian fishing conglomerate coming to raid my poor New England stocks. Okay? Um, so social capital, which is generally laws norms, rules. He probably has some with just his neighbor fishermen that are, we don't compete for the same stuff, we don't sink each other's boats, and so on and so on. But increasingly in a globalized world, he better have that treaty that sets the 200 mile limit or something uh, that says you can't just sail in from the other side of the world, take all my fish and go away. Um, last thing in, in this arrangement, but it also partly fits with, with your notion of the weather. Um, is uh, the actual title of this painting, which is done by Winslow Homer, um, was Fog Warning. And for this fisherman, though clearly fog is a thing he's grown up worrying about, this particular fog bank rolling in and making it so we will have no idea where home is, is a big concern and really hard to predict. 
Uh, today, most of these fissures would have weather services that were doing predictions and warnings based on satellites and so on. So we also have what we might call knowledge capital. Uh, that isn't the wisdom of the particular fisherman, but it is rather we have invested enough to be able to do predictions of fog warnings, of storms. Um, uh, we put up satellites that tell him the thing is coming in, and we build a radio for him uh, that, yeah, the radio is manufactured capital, but the knowledge behind it, even if he drops his radio in the river, the ocean, uh, is a set of knowledge about weather prediction that turns out to be really important uh, to your trajectory of improvement, not dying off in a storm. So um, we could do this for other much more complicated systems. You know, you can split them into different categories, but by and large where the scholarship on this issue has emerged today is thinking about our equivalent of the amps in the battery for human development is these five components. And it, it matters that we think about five rather than one. Um, as I said, the World Bank and most of our national e economic accounting offices have focused forever on just the manufactured capital part. Somewhat more recently, the international community said, oh, oh, wait, human capital is part of development. We have to invest in education and health as well. Good, got it. Uh, we always struggle for the notion of getting natural capital in to look like an asset. There is, except for, I think, maybe India today, no country that includes systematically estimates of the contribution of natural capital to its fuel in the bucket. Uh, we do it on an ad hoc basis, but they don't enter into the national accounts. Um, and knowledge capital, well, you say that's just what we have. Can you imagine anything that results in a decay of knowledge capital? So we say, I mean, many people will say, look, we already know this stuff. Why do we need to invest more in it? Yeah. Marginalization of local traditional knowledge systems by uh, <laughs> dominant scientists. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. So we have one set of knowledge crowd out and exterminate the other. Um, we also, frankly, you know, imagine what the market value of the ability to sail either of these boats is today. Um, uh, not much. Um, the sailing rig, which is a very difficult thing to manage, um, is something that is now a skill that is marginalized because we've invented other sets of knowledge. But the crucial thing is we had to invent that other knowledge. Um, looking a little bit ahead, we'll be talking about uh, antibiotics. Great inventory, great addition to knowledge, but of course, antibiotic efficacy is decaying just because we're depleting it, just like we're depleting the, character, the ability of the atmosphere to absorb carbon dioxide. By using too much of it, animals, you know, bacteria build up a resistance to it. So we're losing it, and we need madly to be inventing new antibiotics just to keep up. That is, if antibiotics were our sole determinant of the fuel in the, the amps in the tank, it would be depleting rapidly through overuse. And unless we're investing in the R&D to create new stuff, um, we're going to be in trouble really soon. So my point is that you could say, well, this is just a classification effort. But it turns out to be pushing really hard against deeply entrenched views of how you think about human well-being and the amps in the battery that underlie it. And that even if we can't put numbers on all of these or figure out the trade-offs among them, I think probably the greatest advance in sustainability science, a systematic scholarly understanding of this challenge in my time, has been us coming to see this amps in the battery now declared in terms of fundamental capital assets, natural capital, manufactured capital, human capital, social capital, and knowledge capital. And understanding that though we may do trade-offs across those, um, harvesting the first cod in the ocean almost certainly, so natural capital went down, but human capital went up. This guy had more disposable income, could send his kids to school, and so on. Not a problem. Harvesting the last cod in the ocean, big problem. Driving to extinction, no more cod to, fund, to, to support this sort of stuff. And Norway has tried that experiment several times, and it's a bad idea. Okay. All right, um, expand that to the real world. I don't expect you to read all this. This stuff is posted in the 
book I referred to in the handouts and so on. But it simply says, if we take this list of capital assets on the left, um, turn that into a systems modeler's view, it turns out these asset stocks, remember they're stocks, not flows. For those of you who do systems modeling, whether as economists or climatologists, um, would be state variables of your system. They are the things which carry forward history this is the state of the world now. That state of the world now we use to forecast the state in the next iteration of the model. Okay? So they're state variables that we study. Who studies them? That's the rightmost column. And the point is, I would argue, whatever discipline any of you come to, you will find yourself sitting over there in the right-hand column. Who are geographers here? One. That's the problem. Two, three, good. Um, 20 years ago, a classroom like this would have had mostly geographers in it because geographers were the only people who actually under, who tried to study the natural environment and the human environment at the same time. But it got really complicated and we decided, well, they're not disciplined enough. They don't come out with really sharp, four significant digit answers. So all across the West, at least, we exterminated geography departments. That was the seventh great extinction. Um, just when we discovered we needed the most, so geographers study all of this stuff. I'm not a geographer. I'm not my own thing. Uh, but otherwise, uh, we have different communities of scholars working in each of those areas, from at the very bottom, people who study research policy and innovation policy, up to the top, people who do earth system science and biodiversity conservation, and in between, lawyers and policy advocates and so on. So the point is, you know, the good news is whatever you do, there's a place for you if you want to contribute to this agenda <coughs> in which your expertise is desperately needed. Uh, the bad news is you've got to make friends with a lot of people coming from other places, or you're going to risk only being concerned with one of those assets, just like fads in the development community have said, now we do manufactured capital, oh no, that was wrong, now we do health capital or human capital, and so on. Uh, so the, the dictum is not that we should produce a bunch of sustainability scientists who are masters of everything here. Uh, we should be masters in the things we can best contribute to, but we've got to understand that we need to draw on the expertise, be able to at least talk the language of people working in those other cells on those other asset groups, or we're going to come up short and narrow uh, in terms of estimating what the amps are in the tank and how we might improve them. Okay, so uh, for those of slightly more uh, formalistic orientation, uh, what we can then say, bringing forward the answer to the first question, what's to be sustained? W, human well-being, inclusive well-being. And what we want is a rate of change in well-being that is not negative. It isn't going down as we go forward in time. And that that rate of change in well-being per unit time is some sort of a function of these five buckets of capital assets. Okay? And the question then is, of course, to figure out what that function is. That's the problem we face, whether you know, that's a problem you face as an economist or as a climatologist or whatever. It's saying sort of we know what we're trying to predict and we know some of the dependent variables. What's the function that tells us how all those variables, in this case the asset classes, are connected with one another so that we can begin to do intelligent interventions to foster one up or expend a little bit more of one for the other, and so on. Okay. So, almost done. Okay. Um, what's most needed from science and technology to study this? And then I'm going to go short on the other two for various reasons I'll explain. Um, so, a slightly different version of what I've been saying. We start at the top with a goal of well-being inclusive well-being across and within generations. We know that we want it at the beginning that we're going to draw on the amps in the, in the battery, these capital assets, to produce that well-being. And the question is, what is this F function? Well, what we know most broadly from basic research is it is thinking about the coupled human environment or social environment system. And there's emerged in the last 15 years a whole field of work on complex human environment or social environmental systems. Um, and uh, we're beginning to understand those. Uh, this is sort of a, 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 a cartoon box and arrows thing. But what you can find, no matter which thing you come in through, is there's your box as a technology person, 
or a ecosystem service person or a climatology person or an economics person. And we know that those things are connected in various ways and interact with each other in really complex systems. What we found, though, is that though basic research is really advancing at how these complicated things, which may be as simple as my fisher trying to figure out how many cod he can take out of the ocean and how much he has to keep that big multinational boat offshore, or as complicated as the actual world we live in with climate change and global trade and so on, um, is that the basic understanding of these complex human environment systems is advancing, but proves almost impossibly fuzzy to actually use to advance whether advanced understanding of whether this policy or that policy would leave me with more fuel, more amps in my tank at the end of the day. So as an approximation, and you know, what is modeling in any field, economics, climatology, whatever, it's always about making simplifications and approximations. The one that has emerged as particularly useful in sustainability work is surprisingly taking the subset of that big complicated social environmental system that is classical production consumption systems. That is producing our energy needs by drawing on capital assets of fossil fuels, so forth and so on. So using a set of production services that are the mining and then the coal plant combustion, generating a set of goods and services, which is produced energy, uh, consuming that in various ways that make your life better, whether for transportation or home heating or whatever, and beginning to look at the subset of that big, real, complicated system with smaller, manageable models of the production consumption systems often built around sectors is the place that, at least for the moment, the field has most rapidly advanced. Um, so we come out with a, 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 a function how these things connect with each other, star, meaning it's just an approximation, uh, but looking at how production consumption systems transform these capital stock assets into well-being, uh, inclusive well-being at the end of the day. That's where a lot of the most productive publishable science is being done right now. Um, it's a real problem um, uh, applied in this case to Germany's efforts to transform how it provides its own energy services from a heavily fossil fuel and nuclear dependent one uh, into one much more dependent on, uh, on renewables. Um, that's something that has been started as a citizen's movement, backed up by government policy, but also deeply informed by technological innovation uh, and understanding of the various parts of the system. And indeed, it is one of these transformations from an unsustainable energy system, fossil fuel based, to a more sustainable one, which is, uh, is renewables based, that I was talking about from the beginning. And the kind of scholarship I'm talking about follows that through. Um, what we determine then is we need to understand these social environmental systems as complex adaptive systems. Uh, they are ones in which uh, there are what do I say here? Yes, full of nonlinearities, which means there are not just smooth transitions, but tipping points, be those extinctions or having the West Antarctic ice sheet uh, collapse or having an economy go into a rapid recession. Uh, they aren't smooth functions. Um, we have to be thinking about how we would include in our models or our conceptualizations the generation of novelty something that most models, whether in the natural sciences or the social sciences, aren't very good with doing, but that the natural world is throwing up all the time in terms of mutations and potential new species. The human world is throwing up all the time in terms of innovations in policy and technology. Uh, we need to find better ways of incorporating that production of novelty uh, in our models, and a lot of work in the field is going on with that. We need to worry about cross-scale impacts. The fact that, say, a unit innovation, the famous garage in which the computers were invented, uh, or the niche on an island in which a new species first emerges, but which of those cascade up to eventually reshape the world where now everybody seems to have a computer, uh, versus which ones just stay isolated in one place? Um, which disease pathogens stay 
doing horrible damage in the one little community they've run loose in, uh, which ones break out of that and cascade upscale, as we've just seen with, say, uh, Ebola or earlier SARS. How do we understand those cross-scale patternings? Um, and finally, what kind of emergent properties do these systems have that we have to care about? Uh, if we go back to the German energy system, which of those systems is most robust to shock, to miscalculation, and so on, versus not? For a long time, Germany, like many other countries, argued that nuclear energy was the clean energy, it was reliable, it could be extremely cheap, but it turns out to be very vulnerable to miscalculation. Uh, it is not a robust system because of the horrid consequences of making small errors, as we saw in Chernobyl, in Fukushima, and so on. And so, in fact, the German energy transition has been remorselessly driving nuclear energy out of its system, not because of efficiency reasons, not because of environmental depletion reasons, but because of non-robustness reasons. And we have that whole issue as we look at human health things, uh, monocrop cultures in agriculture, and the like. So such features of these are still missing from almost every applied piece of work we do. Um, the big criticisms of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, models of future energy trajectories and greenhouse gas loadings, are that virtually none of those things are included in them. They're big, linear, additive, smoothly produced models. It's not quite zero, but most of these factors are very badly captured. Uh, that's a council of despair and saying we're not there yet, but it is a council of optimism and seeing there's lots of work for serious scientists. Okay, um, I'm going to then do a very quick touch on these last two. One, because a bunch of you already suffered through number six in the earlier lecture I gave today. Um, and the second one is because most of us are practicing scientists rather than practicing policymakers. What I will say, though, is that the big addition one needs to make to this cartoon, when it turns out you take seriously, remember all the way back at the beginning, I said pursuing sustainability, that was a more equitable distribution of the ability to advance well-being within and across generations was going to be a huge change in business as usual, meaning it's inherently political. It means in our analytic frameworks, and I'll say for me as a natural scientist, this was the hardest thing to come to understand. We have to bring in actors, agency, and power on the outside. That is, this system of conduction, production consumption processes or the even more complicated social environmental systems isn't just a clockwork mechanism that somehow uh, heaven wound it up at the beginning and it grinds on without people make a difference. People intervene in these systems to try to make that system of production and consumption work to their benefit, usually, sometimes to everybody's benefit, not to other people's benefit. They try to seize resources on their own. They try to seize control of what we produce and what we consume in order to serve some people and not others. People trying to reform present practice know they have to seize that mechanism of production and consumption, which increasingly is, again, driven by radical overconsumption in a few parts of the world, harnessing productive activities all around the world to serve those few. So we have to find ways of internalizing in our models and thinking about this, who has agency, which actors count, and how do they accumulate or how do we uh, how do we diminish the power of actors that are driving the system this way rather than that way? That doesn't demand a takeover of the world. As I say, the German Energiewende was initiated essentially by local communities insisting on grabbing back control of how their power, their electrical power was generated and the state catching up with supportive regulations and technological inventions, but it wasn't a top-down decision by government, much less by world government, to do it. It was citizens insisting they do so. And I'm hoping in some of the cases uh, I invited you to think about early on, you also see a mix of local initiative supported by mesoscale, maybe supported, maybe not, by a layer up. So we could do a whole lecture of this sort on connecting actors and agency, the left side, all the way up to access to the asset stocks we've been talking about on the right side. It would include all this stuff of political processes, institutional arrangements, what influences actors and action. 
Uh, I'm only going to touch on the bottom part of it because it's more in the technical community, which is how we watch the loop of saying, given these actors are in the game, they're seizing this access to the underlying asset resources. What are the consequences of that and do we want to change it? That requires monitoring. As I complained earlier, rather than monitoring how many amps are in the battery, we've been monitoring only the airspeed. World Bank, international organizations, rather than monitoring the asset stocks, they've been monitoring only GNP flows, the equivalent of the airspeed indicator. Uh, so this monitoring process becomes really essential. Um, the power issue becomes really essential. Who, who is directing how that production consumption system works? So my modified version is again now an F double star, which includes adaptive management. That is, it's not fire and forget. It's a feedback system in which we need to be measuring the right stuff, the amps and the battery, not the wrong stuff, just the airspeed and direction. And we need to include not just a passive view of actors and agency, but an aggressive notion to say, how are we going to empower the ones who are currently losing, whether those are poor or politically disempowered people today, or the unempowered people of future generations that have to have some of us standing in in their defense because they aren't at the ballot boxes or the department store checkout counters. Um, but as I say, that would take us down a much wider piece. So um, how can we link knowledge with action? Um, as I said, I just delivered a mini lecture on that in the session before this. And even if you could stand it again, I couldn't. So uh, we won't do it. I just say the challenge there is for those of us who have chosen to spend at least this part of our lives, as it were, in the laboratory as researchers, rather than at the barricades or on the front lines of political change in the world, the question is, how can we take those agitators, those political change agents who are the necessary shock troops of a sustainability revolution, how can we provide them more useful information that they can use to be more effective change agents uh, out there in the real world? Uh, that is a subject that isn't just having opinions. There are now 30 years of really solid research about it um, that uh, you know, I tried to summarize in a paper I circulated for the background of the other talk and should be available to you guys as well. I'd be happy to talk about it in the Q&A, but at this I'm going to stop and say that's what it would have been. Oh, that's where I wanted to end up. So those were the six questions. Those are six tentative, incomplete answers that I think the scholarship of the last decade or so has made some progress in. Uh, but all of the red stuff, all the red stuff, is things that desperately need further contributions from people like you, uh, both in doing your own research but also in insisting to others in your departments, uh, in your universities, and so on, that that kind of research is stuff we need to be doing uh, in order to have a full spectrum uh, approach to these challenges and opportunities of science in support of sustainability. So with that, I will stop um, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Times for questions. This uh, comes now. I like to see many hands raised. It's not that common that we have a proposal for a revolutionary change and we have the proper idea to address to it. So, uh, Yes, my name is Helga Trekkodóttir and I'm a, a PhD student in anthropology, so from a different discipline. Uh, uh, in anthropology, we, we, uh, we study people from the bottom up and uh, there has been a lot of criticism that uh, we mostly focus on, on poor people in poor communities and we don't study power and, uh, or the powerful. So in this regard, I wanted to sort of, because in development studies, th there's also this tendency to study the poor people and the, the poor communities. But I'm kind of interested in my own home country because you said uh, we should think about this from a perspective that we know very well. 
And my home country is the island of Iceland, which is very close to here, but still far away. And uh, there we have, um, we produce seven times more energy than we consume as a nation. And uh, it's more or less all uh, sustainable energy, as in uh, hydropower and geothermal energy. But still we have increased our uh, greenhouse consumption since 1990 by, I think, 42%. Yeah. Because uh, most of that, 80 to 90% of that en uh, energy goes into aluminum production. So basically we are, uh, we are not uh, using more fossil fuels, but we're using much more uh, uh, cleaner energy in a way. But since we use it all in production of aluminium, it is, it is also uh, po um, it's so important to, to see the consumer production perspective because what the arguments uh, are used for this is that uh, it, will be, it will mean that the, this production is done not with coal but with uh, green energy. However, if you produce something, that also means that the company producing it needs to sell it and they need to find uh, someone willing to buy it, even though, uh, even though maybe the need or the yeah uh, the the drive behind it is uh, from that perspective not uh, driving the production, but the production is driving the consumption. Um, am I making myself clear? So wrap it up. So what I think uh, I would like to hear from you is. Uh, how do we put the economics into this equation of yours? Um, we need to think about the economics also, not just maybe human development, because the economics is driving force behind all of this. Really, someone has to make money, right? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, if it, is this uh, clear as a question? Well, thank you very much. Okay. Um. I agree completely. Um, uh, usually having said that uh, a simplification of this complicated social environmental system that is looking at production consumption systems, uh, usually at that point seven people jump up in the audience and scream, you're, you're just being an economist. So usually I get the other critique, there's too much economy uh, in here. Um, I, I think, I mean, all the points you raise are, are fine. I would come back and say, which are, which are the asset stocks that you think are suffering, and which are the asset stocks that you think are improving uh, as a basis of Iceland using clean energy to produce a lot of aluminum? Um, uh, if there were no aluminum, people would be using concrete, which is a huge greenhouse gas emitter, uh, or they'd be using heavier substances to ship things in, which presumably would use up more dirty energy. Um, but you know, we have very little understanding of this link between production, pushing consumption, and vice versa. Um, I think it's a great area to spend time worrying about. Uh, I'd be curious what, what uh, you know, Iceland has a great response to the Paris Accords on climate change. Uh, they haven't quite stepped up to what they're gonna do with their response to the SDGs of the UN. Uh, that's where they'll have to grapple with this. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll just um, follow up from what we heard from Iceland. I come from France, and when I was trying to think of an issue that I know about, uh, I thought it was particularly difficult to decide which of the assets we should try to preserve. I'm thinking of a case of an aluminium factory that releases pollution into the Mediterranean. And so there has been a lot of campaigning to s stop that release of pollution and preserve the sea. But the other arguments are, and especially from one of our um, uh, green MP for the area, it says if we impose too much on the factory, they're just going to close in this area and move to Italy, which is like 200 kilometers away, so it's not much. And the stuff they release in the sea will be released from across the border, but it will go into the same sea and do the same pollution. So his argument is, although he's a green MP and it's a bit contradictory, he says we should keep them here 
and lobby and put pressure to make them improve. And the other argument is, so, so we could keep jobs, so we might want to defend the sea, we might want to defend the jobs locally for our region, and also they produce aluminium, which is uh, something that's needed, and so it might be another thing we want to defend is keep that production going for that resource. So my question is, how do we decide what we try to sustain? So this is one of the cases where the good news is relative to 10 years ago, I think we know the answer to that as a matter of theory. And, and this will sound weak. 10 years ago, I would argue, the field had absolutely no foundation on which to answer that. The theory answer right now is the thought experiment you want to do is compute the social value, value to all people's well-being everywhere, this inclusive well-being, of the choice between continuing to keep heavy industry in France with the political processes you have that might be able to force it to clean up versus let's take the extreme strategy of shifting all of your heavy industry not just to Italy but to the rapidly developing East Asia countries um, and compute as a mental exercise what would be the social value and damage of doing that? Now, we don't know, but we can begin to make some estimates. And what I think one would have to think very carefully about is whether looking over the long run, not only is this a matter of, of French jobs now versus, let's say, Chinese jobs now, um, it's also a matter of in which place do we think we have a better opportunity of political actors concerned with not radically depleting the natural capital base, intervening and bringing some control and improvement in technologies or even changes in production, changes in what we use as industries that furnish our jobs and employment for. And I could make an argument there with no, no I'm not trying to beat up on China, um, that there's a very good case for keeping um, things like this in countries, especially with active green movements, um, as long as they're politically empowered. Is your MP still in office this morning? <laughs> yeah, well, I was about to say, politics is volatile. But I think there is a good case for keeping stuff at home in places that can exert green pressure rather than exporting it out. So I, I respect your former MP. Uh, okay. Um, but the, de the devil would be in the details and we have to do it. But we begin to know how we ought to answer that question. And it would be this increments to social value. Well, if no one else, oh, you have. But Professor Clark, seems, since we are at university now, I was wondering, in your experience, uh, how well do universities do providing useful information for informed agitation. How would we are <laughs> when we publish something to inform the public? Um, okay. Um, I've used this phrase, informed agitation, to try to emphasize that because of the radical changes in the way society operates that are needed to move towards sustainability, to poverty alleviation over the long run. Um, we need political agitation in the streets. There is no way that the people who hold the power now are going to give it up just because they're deciding to be educated. Um, that said, as the example of, uh, that you guys have raised suggests, it's not absolutely clear what you would tell the agitators the most important thing to agitate for is. And there, I think the universities and other people with the luxury to do research and critical scholarship do have a responsibility to help, to help the agitators who are really great about integrating what people are demanding. But sometimes, as in my country in the biofuels example, what people are demanding was right, but it needed to be Brazilian biofuels, not American biofuels, because our biofuels are terrible. And we were far too slow 
in my community to raise that alarm. We could have known that, and we didn't do it because we thought it was so cool that a bunch of political agitators were pushing for green energy. And we didn't ask the question, well, like, how do you know this is green? Um, universities have always struggled with this balance between being a place for the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake, unfettered by political pressure and so on, a very good thing, with the expectation of society that the support it gives universities through research, through stipendiums, through being state schools, should somehow benefit society. And in the extreme, say, the investment in science in the United States after the Second World War, it was an entirely trickle-down theory. You fund the scientists to do whatever they want to do, and eventually society will, will benefit from it. At the other extreme, we have built polytechnical schools. We've built public health schools. We've built medical schools to provide very particular linkages from universities to very focused areas of practice, building better industry, building better health, and so on. Um, I think the challenge, right, so we know how to do this. We've done it in agricultural schools, which have worked to improve agricultural production. What we don't have many of, though in Europe you actually have several, are, as it were, sustainability schools that would be doing for the modern age what the polytechnics and the ag schools and the public health schools uh, have done and are still doing very usefully today. That is a place that would say the problem to be solved is sort of like what I've sketched here, and the need is to bring together not just agronomists or just machine engineers or just public health people, but particular combinations of those to address some of these problems. I think some universities do a better job than not at giving their faculty and students flexibility to self-organize to address those issues. Some, like, I mean, strikes me, Leuphana in Germany, uh, Arizona State in uh, the United States, have actually said we are, we are a school uh, of sustainability studies, and that's their central organizing principle. Um, it's yet to be seen whether that approach is better than just increasing the latitude and ability of facilitating collaboration uh, in more normal places like this. Thank you very much. Very useful. We shall take one and a half more questions. Uh, so please, please, please. Should I take the one or the half? <laughs> OK, thank you, Professor. It's a very excellent uh, lecture. And uh, I was wondering about your like question and answers for the sustainability science. Mm, because you know, uh, as in the beginning of your presentation, we can see there is clear differences between like us in Asia, China, Africa, and those of you in America and uh, Europe, Europe. So I was wondering, it seems like you proposed a general framework for this sustainability science. But in China, we have a saying that you should adopt uh, circumstances according to the local situations. So how can we apply this in our own country in case that we don't have a professor like you in our government, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, one of the central findings in sustainability science, most often associated with the name of, of the late Nobel Prize winner Eleanor Ostrom, is that you need both. That is that, yes, you need to start with the people whose lives and livelihoods will be influenced by these decisions to try to bend society one way or the other, but that there are <clears throat> real limitations on how far you can go with that without at least supportive structures, um, a layer above and above and above. So I will push back to you with your very, you know, China always has a really good saying on almost any topic. Um, uh, this China that says uh, you should uh, pay attention to the local uh, is also emerging as perhaps the world's leader on international climate negotiations and have managed to build the largest investment in manufactured capital infrastructure uh, both transportation and energy of any country ever in the world 
in the shortest amount of time. That was not a bottom-up operation. That was a top-down operation. And I think the example of China is, is very interesting right now as they come to grapple with the problem of acute air pollution in its cities. That's, a, at least from outside, looks to be a very interesting issue of protests coming from local communities and pushing up. Uh, China governance officials, uh, one, being worried about it because it's worrisome, but also being worried about problems of, of stability and political legitimacy, uh, but able to now begin putting in some really quite substantial investments that no local community could do on its own uh, in terms of trying to move back towards electrification of automobiles, reinstituting bicycle lanes. I just came back from Shanghai and watching the efforts there and so on. So I, I think it, we, we're way beyond top down versus bottom up. We realize you need to blend the two of them. And the question is how, and we know the answer will be different uh, for China than for Uganda than for the United States. Uh, but I will bet that in all of those cases, it will be a blending of the two. Okay, so we can say that you took the one and a half question. And she only took the one question. I took the one and a half answer. Uh, no, 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 that was no, the no. problem. Uh, uh, she did just right. What I wanted to say is that uh, we are very happy uh, about this. We learned a lot. And we just deserve a round of applause. Um, because even talking as fast as I talked, uh, you can't say everything in uh, a session like this. Uh, this thing, which will also be posted on the web, lists a set of sources of further argument, both at the conceptual level, which is this book I recently finished, but then at just the level of where do you see the actual basic new research of sustainability science appearing in the open literature. And you were so good that the rector and the authorities uh, are providing this for you. This is the most usable instrument here in Bergen. Yeah. It's an umbrella, and since you work in usable knowledge, <laughs> This is just the right thing to <laughs> give it to you. <laughs> and of course, we have all the nice things for you. <laughs> thank you so much. Home. Thank you uh, so much. Thank you, all of you, for being here. Uh, we are just on time. And as I said to you thank before, you. Uh, Norwegians are very proud to start on time and end on time. And they were desperate because a Latin American guy was in charge of the administration of time. And an American professor was talking. You know, <laughs> this is really bad. So thank you uh, to all of you. Thank you.